Okay, so now we reach the end game. Practicing righteousness. That's the whole story. Oh, okay, so you, as usual, you know, the truth, the real truth and the real God are totally simple and elegant. That's what Einstein was constantly searching for when he was trying to solve the pants question. It's um, called unified field theory in physics. He was trying to, it, 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 the idea among physicists is that the, the universe is wearing, has a pants. Now the pants is general relativity to explain mass, okay, on the one hand. And then on the, the other pair of pants was quantum dynamics, okay, quantum mechanics. The rules of the two things are opposites. And what Einstein, who thought the quantum dynamics was inelegant, he was trying to figure out how to solve the small and the right-hand side of the pants, so to speak. He was trying to resolve the small end of physics to account for general relativity. And what he kept on telling everybody was, hi, whatever the answer is, it's simple and it's elegant. I mean, if you go on the web, Google, or whatever, um, or, you know, go into YouTube, and you search on unified field theory, or pants, because that's their, their colloquial name for it, you'll find all kinds of videos that are really very interesting to watch about people attempting to find an elegant, simple solution, okay? And it has basically four elements in their minds. Okay, one of which is gravity, obviously. And then you got energy and matter, and I forget what the fourth one is. And they're trying to use those four elements to come up with a simple, fractalic type formula that will explain everything. And they also call it the theory of everything. Okay? So here's the theory of everything when it comes to God. Practicing righteousness. Now, you knew that since you were a kid, didn't you? But you don't know what it means. Practicing righteousness. If I said that to the stupidest Christian on earth, they would say, oh yeah, of course God's about practicing righteousness. But what each Christian considers practicing and what each Christian considers righteousness is totally different from what God considers. See the point? Just like the theory of everything that the physicists are looking for, the cosmologists and physicists, <coughs> God's theory of everything is practicing righteousness in every single way. That's one of the biggest reasons why he ordained truth be free. Remember when I started this series, Why Evil? God's design philosophy at the very beginning. What does he say? Truth be free. Why? It's the worst choice you can make. Okay, but is life worth living if it's not free? No. Would truth be truth if it weren't free? No. It's an uncomfortable truth that's free. The truth has to be free. So God's theory of everything is practice righteousness all the time, in every way, on every unrighteousness. Well, then truth can afford to be free. You see that? If God's practicing righteousness on everything, no matter how low or how high or how bad or how evil, I mean, Satan's going to live forever. How does God get paid for that? Well, you know, theologians, half of them will agree and half of them won't. Christ had to have paid for Satan's sins on the cross. Otherwise, it's not fair to God that Satan left. Same thing for you and me, because we know that God, that Satan, I mean, that Christ paid for you and me. But he had to pay for all the angels, too, because their sins go on forever. And what about the elect angels? Assuming they had a salvation. My pastor flipped both ways on that question. They sinned. They wouldn't be called elect if they hadn't sinned. 
They wouldn't be called elect if there wasn't some salvation plan for them. Because we're called elect, and we know we got a salvation plan. Does God have to repeat himself? This isn't an argument from silence, which you're never supposed to do from scripture. This is an argument from high. You got one answer using the same vocabulary. Okay, so now is it so hard to say hi? That's a parallel to what came before you? Duh. Okay, so if there's a salvation plan, then God is making good on all the bad, isn't he? So what, he's only going to save us? Hardly. There's other things than us in the universe. Hi, I'm sitting in a chair. The chair needs to be saved. Why should God look at a chair? Why should a chair even exist? Chair is part of cost of doing business to save me because I'm sitting in it. It's a wonderful chair. But I got others that aren't so wonderful. They sure need saving. They're broken. This chair was initially broken when it arrived. I mean, broken in the sense that it was assembled and put into a box in pieces and I had to put it together. It's wonderful now that it's put together. But I had to do that to the chair to make it worth my time to have the chair. If it just sat in the box and all those pieces, well, then it needs rescuing, doesn't it? To give it a good, useful life, assuming, you know, if the chair had consciousness, it would scream at it being a chair. But presume, presume it wanted to be a chair. So, oh, I get to be Brain Out's chair and I'm so happy I have a purpose in life. Well, then I rescued the chair, didn't I, when I put it together after, I took, after the, they shipped it to me. I saved the chair. Well, who caused me to be able to save the chair? God. So who saved the chair? God. See, it's not just us that the salvation question applies to. It applies to everything. It applies to the June bugs who flip over on its back and its poor little legs are up in the air because it can't turn over. The poor thing is flopped on its big heavy back and it flops on its big heavy back about every 30 seconds because it, God made it funny. Satan would argue God made it defective. Poor thing, it flops on its back every 30 seconds. So you save the June bug by turning it over so it can walk until the next 30 seconds. And you can't police it. You just pray that the June bug doesn't flip on its back again. I should have done that. The June bug needs saving. The grass on your lawn or on somebody else's lawn needs saving. Your mouse needs saving. You have to clean it. You have to put batteries in it if it's wireless. It's got to be properly hooked up if you've got a wired mouse. Everything needs saving. Well, God likes rescuing everything. That's practicing righteousness. On what? Unrighteousness. Is it righteous for a June bug to be on its back? Flailing with its legs in the air? That's not fair to the June bug. The June bug didn't create itself. Junebug didn't create its nature, its too heavy back, its weak legs, its short life. God created that. So who to save it but God? Okay, God can save directly or indirectly. He can save through mediaries. Still him doing the work. Just because I get the privilege of stating the gospel or the Bible to people... And I, you know, there are consequences that go with that when I screw up. I get punished more. Okay, that's not really me saving somebody. It's a privilege and I enjoy it. And yeah, people are helped by it. But I didn't actually help them. God did it. He used me like a spoon. Well, hey, I'm glad to be a spoon. I'm glad to be a chair. I'm glad to be a June bug then. Because <coughs> don't you think that June bug saved me when I flipped it over on its legs? I got to practice righteousness at that moment. And that satisfaction remains. I actually did that. I think it was yesterday, the day before, day before yesterday. Poor thing was just right outside my, my door, and I was getting ready to leave, and I saw the poor thing flipped on its back. So I picked up a little piece of wood, because it's not good to touch animals with your own fingers. It, it, it scares them. So I used a little piece of wood to flip it over on its legs and get it to a safe place so it could recover. Well, that was, that was a happiness moment for me. I really enjoyed it. It tasted good. 
I didn't do it in order to think well of myself, and I didn't do it to do a good deed. I did it because I, I know how it would feel if I was flipped over my back and my legs and arms were flailing. I mean, after all, I sprained my, you know, my arm back in October, and it took almost six months to recover just from a sprain. I'd hate to think what it would be like for a June bug to be flailing its legs up in the air, unable to help itself. So I got to save it, as it were, but it's really God who saved it. I got to practice righteousness. I'm a spoon of God practicing righteousness at that moment. Now, the June bug doesn't know anything about it. The June bug has no awareness of me. They saw this big blue thing, because I was wearing a big, I think it was blue sweatshirt at the time. It might have been tan. It saw this big hovering fabricy blue thing or brown thing or tan thing hovering over it. And the next thing it knows, it's able to walk. So, it doesn't know anything about me. Nor does it have to. I know about it. God knows about us. God knows about your mouse. God knows about the cup of coffee you're going to take and it's going to spill on your desk. He's out to rescue every single moment. Brand it. Baptize it with some value that pleases Him. Well, what else could you ask for in life? Now, people ask for a lot of things in life that they think save them, that they think make them happy. We equate salvation and happiness. Yeah, okay. But you know what? The things we go after in this life, they don't save. That's what God's saying in Isaiah 55, which you just threw at me. Why do you spend your money on things that don't satisfy Buy, drink, eat, without money and without price. That's Isaiah 55. It's, it's good enough in translation. Go look it up. Every moment you're spending, don't you want to enjoy it? Don't you want to have a satisfaction out of being alive that moment? Isn't that the big quest we all have? Our lives are so boring. And they seem so meaningless. And unless you're engaged in a, watching a movie you like or eating food you like or doing some activity you like, then you forget about how meaningless you feel most of the time. You get a little escape. You get a little recreation. But isn't it really the high point of your day, and I mean day, when you get something done or you engage in an activity that is tasty, to you. Okay. Well, God wants every moment to be tasty to Him. So what else is there to want out of life than that? Because, honey, I'm telling you right now, and I've learned this just recently because He's flipping me over to the prosperity side of things. How much can you buy before it becomes boring? I mean, most people think that, oh, if I only had more money, I'd be happy. Oh, yeah? I didn't, I, I, you know, two, three years ago, I had two dollars in my bank account, and he rescued me on that day, which was the day my the anniversary of my pastor's death. I got an inheritance on that day. And I talked about it, at, you know, when relevant, at points in the videos um, since, what was it, December, uh, August of 2010. And so now I'm in a position where I can buy things. You know how boring it gets? You have to make all these decisions and compare all these things. I bought six computers, and it took me eight months to figure out what kind of computer to get because there's all that nonsense with Windows 8 and Windows 7 and Linux and how do those operating systems all work and are they going to be compatible with what I have and then you got all these different parts to a computer and they got all these jargon names. It took me eight months to figure out what to buy for six computers that I bought. It was a nightmare. So my money problem got solved, but you know what? The buying problem didn't. Okay, but every moment you're alive, you're buying something. Doesn't seem like it. You got each moment just like God does, just like God does, to practice righteousness. Okay, but what does that mean? Now we go full circle back to the beginning of this audio. 
We all know that it's, that God is about practicing righteousness. Okay, but what does that mean? It means everything. The theory of everything. The unified field theory of God. He just wants to spend all of his moments, which are total, infinite, in one big now, really, practicing righteousness on everything. So see, to you and me, we live each moment in time as a sort of linear thing. And we all speculate about time travel and all that stuff. I love sci-fi. But we're experiencing one moment at a time, and the sun comes up and the sun goes down. And then the sun comes up again. So we're experiencing these revolutions, okay, of the day revolving revolution. Not, you know, fight revolution. But we have a revolution inside our soul to fight, too. Am I going to practice righteousness the next second? Well, we don't do that because it isn't tasty to us. It isn't tasty. But it is tasty to God. Every moment he's unifying high to low. He's putting himself, you you know, by, you know, indirectly or directly using somebody or things. So that those somebodies or those things get to have a role in his own practice of righteousness on an object. He loves doing that. And you know, it's a wonderful thing to be part of that. I love being a spoon. My chair, if it had consciousness and, you know, relative to its own nature, would love being Brainout's chair. Oh, I get to be a chair for Brainout so Brainout can make this audio. And the audio is talking about God, so now I'm a part of God. See how that works? That makes it tasty. Isn't that weird? That's what this is all about. Each moment, today, right now. And of course that's Hebrews 3 that he just threw in my mind. Today, while it's yet today. Practice righteousness. What does God think about this moment you're in? The email, I've said this a thousand times now, so now you should, you should be able to see how the strategy is fitting to the tactic. Every moment I've been saying the tactic is to apply the Bible that you know to whatever you're doing, to whatever you're thinking. What should I be thinking now, Dad? What should I be doing now, Dad? What should my attitude be, Dad? God has a a will for absolutely everything in your life. He has a will for your location. He has a will for your job. He has a will for whether you should be married or not. He has a will for who you should be married to. He has a will for what kind of activity you should be doing at a given moment. What is it? So you get the pleasure of knowing God better, and you get the pleasure of trying to practice, and you'll always fail, but at least you're trying. Practicing righteousness. And that's what 1 John is all about, which he just threw into my mind. Practicing righteousness. I, I, you know, the Greek verb is poieo, and then it's dikaiosune. Dikaiosune is translated righteousness, but it means more than that. It's the thinking of a judge. My pastor spent a lot of time explaining that. The chaos means righteous, and sune means the activity or the sort of thought pattern of a thing. Okay, so you've got the chaos sune, righteousness activity, righteousness thinking, righteousness mindset, really. The mindset of a judge. What's right? What's wrong? What's good? What's bad? Remember in a previous increment I talked about how you end up becoming really analytical and people don't like that? But God is like that. So what do you care if people don't like it? Just don't let them see it happen too much in you so they won't be offended. God's not offended. Practicing righteousness. Okay, I'm lifting up this mouse. Does it need cleaning? Should I clean it? Maybe something else is more important to do at that moment. That's a lot of analytical thinking. Okay, but you're practicing righteousness. And failing because you'll, you know, you'll get all anal and get into something you shouldn't be getting into or you won't spend enough time. Reverse. But you're, you're in the mindset of righteousness. What's right? What's wrong? What's good? What's bad? And the Christian, even the babyest Christian, knows that. But he can't do anything with it. Because he doesn't know Bible well enough. He doesn't know God well enough. So he's flailing like the June bug on his back through his life. And there's nobody to put the stick where his legs are so he can grab onto the stick and turn the stick over so that the June bug can turn over. There's nobody around to do that. 
So the Christian keeps flailing. And the actual truth of it is, which is even worse, if somebody puts a stick so his legs can grab onto it, he doesn't want to grab onto it. Because there's plenty of Bible out there that Christians just don't want to study. They want to sing hymns. They want to do rah-rah Jesus songs. So they'll feel like they're holy. But they won't be. They want the little homily. They want the little ritual. They want the little nothingness that passes for Christianity with the with the five-year-old theology that's, that's mainstream today. They don't know that this is what the game is. God's about the process. He is not about whether it wins or loses. If Satan won tomorrow, that would be just fine. You say that to the average Christian, he'll think that you're a heretic. But it's the truth. See, God's going to end up winning in this big, long conflict story fight with Satan and company, but it doesn't matter if he wins. What matters is that he's practicing righteousness. That's what's tasty to God. For its own sake. I mean, think about it real hard. We go on living forever. Hell goes on forever. If it was about winning or losing, then either we would be very different from the way we are, or there wouldn't be a hell. In other words, the bad stuff continues forever. We are bad even when perfect in the sense that we're limited. What can we do for God? He has to con continually maintain us. He has to continually take care of us. Even when we're higher than the angels, okay, at the end, that's the promise. That's what 1 John um, 2, 26 through 3, 2 is explaining. And that's what uh, Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 15. And um, that's what the uh, book of Hebrews explains in Hebrews 1 and 2. Christ was lower than angels. He won. So now everybody in him, that's us, in John 17 prayer, is going to be higher than the angels. I don't know if the Old Testament saints are going to be higher than the angels. I haven't figured that out yet. But definitely churches, because we're going to be ruling the angels. I'm not quite sure how that works either. I get a sense it's a federated sort of thing. In other words, we're the like chief kingdom in eternity, and we're a federation of kingdoms, and all the other kingdoms in eternity, the angels' kingdoms, the Old Testament kingdoms, they kind of like go through us as an intermediary. That's my sense of it. I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. But assuming that's the case then all we're going to be doing, just like all God ever does, is maintaining, maintaining, maintaining. Liaison, caring for, working on, everybody taking care of everybody else. Just like we do down here, except there's no sin nature and we're light years higher in ability. Okay, but nobody's as high as God. So he's still doing all the caring. He's still doing all the maintaining. He's still practicing righteousness on something lower than himself. So that must be his big, what do you want to call it? I mean, you know, don't get too offended, but I, I don't know a better word to describe it. That must be his big orgasm. I mean, you know, it's not sexual. A thrill that is so high that you have to compare it to something that everybody would understand. Well, that's a comparative term. Actually, I don't know what that is it's for you know, 30 years. But everybody in society seems to think that's a really big deal. So that's the term I'm using. God really gets off on practicing righteousness. It's tasty to him. So that's where fulfillment and satisfaction are. Yire, yizba. He just threw that into my mind. That's Isaiah 53, 11. He sees, he's satisfied. Yizba. It comes from Sabea in Hebrew, and it means to eat a good meal and be full afterwards, satisfied and full. From eating, tasting. Not, oh, I'm a little goody two-shoes, I'm such a good Christian. There's no satisfaction in that. Absolutely zero satisfaction in considering yourself a good Christian or having a high opinion of yourself. There is no satisfaction there. The satisfaction comes from the intrinsic if it tastes good, that's an intrinsic. If it if it 
it's fulfilling. That's an intrinsic. Well, God's saying, hey, the only thing that's fulfilling is practicing righteousness. doesn't matter if I win. I just got to practice it. Just because. So, look. Pretend Satan wins tomorrow. Okay, he wins and the way he would win is if he can get Christians to be thoroughly apostate so that not one more Christian grows. <coughs> and therefore nobody believes in the gospel because we're not saying it right anymore. That's the criterion for the rapture. When the growth stops. Okay. Let's say that that happens in five minutes. No, we'll just say an hour from now. Because I'll be done before then. So one hour from now, that's when that point is reached. Nobody's going to grow anymore. Nobody's going to believe in the gospel anymore because it's not being said right anymore. Nobody's going to be saying it right. So nobody can be saved because the gospel's not out there. Or nobody will read the Bible to find out what it really says because the Bible's got it right, even in translation. So then God has to recall church. Well, what if he has to recall church before church is actually finished in its, you know, permutations? The society, the perfect society that God's creating for heaven. If Satan can stop that from happening, then Satan wins in the trial. Okay, so let's say he does. Let's say one hour from now, Satan wins. Maybe it takes longer than an hour for the whole story to play out. But let's say that, that the point at which the victory occurs is an hour from now. What would happen? Well, after the, you know, the logistics play out, Satan would be ruling the universe. He would be able to dictate to God anything he wants. And God would obey. All three of them. Because that's practicing righteousness. If God lost, and it can happen because he's letting truth be free, and he's letting the humans determine the outcome of the conflict, and he's willing to bend and lose based on that. He's not gerrymandering history. He's not gerrymandering his own victory. He just knows it's going to happen. Then Satan will win. And Satan could dictate to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, anything he wanted done, and, that, and each one of them would do it. Okay. Well, so? I'm dead serious. God would still be practicing righteousness even if he lost. Because it would be righteous to obey if he lost. Now, I don't know. Satan imagines that he's torturing God if he wins. Satan gets off on the idea of being able to dictate to God what Satan wants done. That's his big thrill. That's his big goal. That's why he hasn't given in until yet, and he never will. So Satan's going to imagine that he'd be happy in that condition. He won't be. He's not happy now, so he's not going to be happy then. But God would still obey, and he would still be practicing righteousness, just as he's doing now. Now those of us who are under him would still be under him, obviously. If he's sustaining us now, he'd be sustaining us then. Satan does not have the power to sustain us. Now, what would Satan want? I don't know, but it doesn't matter. Because we would still be under God, he'd still be sustaining us. And whatever it was that Satan wanted, we'd still be under God. I don't actually care if Satan wins for that reason. Would you? You still get to be with God. You still get to be under God. Does it matter if Satan wins? No. Because what I want out of this life is to be with God. And if that meant, if Satan said, okay, hi, you're going to send all of the elect into that same lake of fire you're going to put me into, and you're going there too, God would go, and we would go. Okay, but then the lake of fire isn't a lake of fire to me anymore. If I'm with God, I don't care if it's a lake of fire that I'm with him in. 
as long as I'm with him. The true lake of fire to me is to be apart from him. And when I first believed in him, knowingly believed in him at 18, that was the big deal to me. You're with God or apart from him. I didn't care where apart from him would be. I don't care if it's a paradise. And you know, earth is a place to be apart from him. And there's a lot of paradises down here and I don't like any of them. They're all tawdry to me. You stuck me in Tahiti or Fiji tomorrow with the little mint julep or whatever it is on the beach that everybody dreams of. I hate it. Because it's not with God. It's not that God isn't in the pretty places too. But that lifestyle itself, by itself, is not attractive to me. But if you say, okay, hi, you can be with God in the lake of fire, which maybe Satan would want us all to go to, well, fine. It'll hurt. I won't like it, but I'm hurting now. And I got a nice life now. I had a not-so-nice life three years ago. But I was with God in that, and I'm with God in this, and so as long as I'm with God, honey, I don't care how nice it feels. So I don't care if Satan wins, do you? I care about being with God. So see... Righteousness is something that's tasty, and if it hurts at the same time, so what? I would rather it didn't hurt at the same time. I would rather it be nice. But as long as I got him, honey, I don't care. I don't care if Satan wins. And that's the ultimate victory of the thing. That's the irony of this. It doesn't matter if Satan wins. It doesn't matter if evil wins. It doesn't matter if, you know, you know, think of your most evil scenario for the earth. I mean, to me, the most evil scenario for the earth is already true, already happening. Christians are clueless. That's hell, in my opinion. They don't know God. They don't want to know God. When you're five years old, you want five-year-old things. So knowing God is not on that list, you'll hallucinate that you know him. But don't. And that's the way it's been for 2,000 years. And to me, that's total hell because I'm sitting here looking at how gorgeous and he is and what he really thinks and what he really wants. And all my fellow believers who are my brothers and sisters technically in Christ, they don't have a clue. And I can't help them. Nor do they want my help. They resent anything I say. So I might as well be alone then. But if I'm with him, I don't care if I'm alone. See, that's practicing righteousness. That's the mindset God has. Look, I get to practice righteousness. Nothing can stop that. Nothing. The only person who can stop... Practicing righteousness is the person who's practicing it. Nobody outside you can make you stop. Nobody can make God stop practicing righteousness even if Satan wins. So God wins either way. He still gets to do what he wants. I give, I'm practicing righteousness no matter what. So why not have a conflict? Why not allow everything to be evil? He can practice righteousness on it. He can practice the righteousness of allowing it to exist. Because that is righteous. It's righteous to allow freedom. Even if the freedom that's being practiced is bad. And he wins. Even if he loses. Because there's always something he's saving. That's the joy of it for him. Isaiah 55. Do that which tastes good, which is satisfying, without money and without price. Meaning, you're not getting paid for it. Meaning, you're not paying for it either. To him, he's not paying for it, even though he is. I mean, because he's sustaining us. That's a cost, technically. But he doesn't consider it a cost because he loves doing it. See how all these other things I said in the prior episodes from the beginning of this Satan strategy series are coming to pass? You just can't defeat practicing righteousness. It can't be defeated, except by yourself. So you're the victor. You're going after something that you want. 
And technically speaking, you're devoting everything in yourself to it. So technically speaking, that's cost. But you don't care. When you go after something that you really, 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 really want, you don't consider your efforts a cost. You consider them a privilege. You consider yourself lucky to have it. You always feel that you should have done more. That's God's attitude about righteousness. And nothing stops him from being able to practice it. So nothing stops you either. Even if Satan won, even if this er world, and it occasionally does, and actually always is, turns totally evil. Let's say the Muslims take over the world tomorrow. That would be pretty bad. I mean, you know, when George Orwell wrote 1984, he should have just Islamicized it to get the real story. But he was thinking of communism. He says he wasn't thinking of communism when he wrote that story, but he really was. Or at least his story came out that way. Let's put it that way. George Orwell was very influential in my thinking in life. Um... He wrote 1984, An Animal Farm. He was basically depicting the inherent evil of the human race in wanting to control other humans, which is the essence of religion. Okay? Politics and religion are two sides of the same coin. And war happens when you've got conflicting religions or conflicting, you know, um, ideologies. Okay, well... Islam is a terrorist ideology. It's definitely a satanic thing. Okay, let's say the Muslims won tomorrow. So, they can therefore regulate your behavior, and it's just like 1984, really, especially the movie, you know, with um, Richard Burton and John Hurt. It'd be a world like that. It'd be a world like the hundred, no, just after the hundred flowers moving, the cultural revolution under Mao. It'd be a world like Stalinist Russia, except to be Islamicized. Everything dreary, everything black, everything regulated, everything cruel. Okay, but they can't get to your soul. You could take those same circumstances and in your soul, practice righteousness before God. And yeah, they make you stick your butt up in the air and you're supposed to be chanting the Quran. Okay, but you can be chanting the Quran but thinking about God at the same time. They can't control your thought. You can be living to God even while you're sticking your butt up in the air and chanting the Quran. And yeah, your life on the outside is dreary and dismal and boring. But it's dreary and dismal and boring now. We got more trinkets, you know, because under Islam you're not allowed to have the trinkets. So. See what I'm saying? Nothing can defeat practicing righteousness. And you practice righteousness in your head. The body is just follow through. And it's tasty. Sorry for all the phone calls. It's tasty. It's tasty to just go after something because it's right. Even if you fail. It's fulfilling to try. It's a fight all the time and it hurts all the time. But it's a fulfilling reason to live. And it's God's own reason to live. Should you take out the trash? Should you do an email? Should you watch TV? If so, what program? Why watch the program? When watching the program, what are you learning about God from the program? And you can learn about God from anything. People kind of hate me for that. I remember one guy saying to me, How come you relate everything to Bible? I didn't realize I was doing that. <laughs> because it's tasty to do that, okay? That's why I do it. I like seeing connections between, you know, the stucco on my wall. I have stucco walls. 
I like thinking about how all those little bits of cement that are sort of make this kind of pattern in the wall, how they depict the stars in the sky and the, all the dots that God likes to baptize to make good on them. So every time I look at the suckle, I'm reminded of God. You get that? It kind of looks like the universe with all the stars, some bigger than others. And God's uniting all of them. Even though technically the uniting that's occurring on the wall is through the paint over all these little bits and pieces of concrete, I guess it is. It's a nice cream color. I enjoy that. It's an enjoyable thing to relate everything to God. Okay, hi, you're going to do an email. Why not relate it to God? That's enjoyable. See, the human mind wants to say, oh, you should do good. You should be good. You should want good. But it also want, the human mind also wants to say that it's boring to do a good thing. It's only fun if you're sinning. That's the way the human mind works. That sin is fun, and you're a good person if you avoid fun by not sinning. And doing a good deed is what you should do, but you're not supposed to enjoy it. That's the human that's the human definition, particularly the Christian definition of good. Something you do that you don't want to do that doesn't feel good or taste good and 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 it's 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 not supposed to feel good or taste good in order to be good. That's a load of crap. It's tasty to practice righteousness. But you have to develop the taste. When you're five years old, you like ice cream. But not broccoli. Well, when you're 20 years old, you learn to enjoy the taste of broccoli. Or maybe broccoli is not it for you. Picture, picture some other food that you didn't like when you were five, but you like a lot now that you're 20. I love spinach always, so I can't pick spinach. I'm dead serious. We tell ourselves what tastes good. And our old sin nature is dictating to us that righteousness doesn't taste good, but sin does. That's a load of crap. When you learn the Bible, you learn to see through God's eyes, and then you learn what things really taste like. And the more you learn, the more you learn that righteousness tastes good. You learn to want it just because. And here you are, totally indefeatable. What do my pastor call that? Uh, cognitive invincibility. It's the last stage of the spiritual life. When you realize that you are cog, you realize cognitive. Cognitive means that you know. You have cognitive invincibility that whatever you do in this life can't be defeated. Because God's already won. And see how he has already won? Satan can beat God in the trial and it doesn't even matter. Because God just gets off on practicing righteousness. And if Satan won, he would God would still be practicing righteousness to obey Satan. So you could be in an Islamic republic, and you could still be practicing righteousness, even though you're obeying, on the surface, the Quran. So it doesn't matter if you're in a communist country. It doesn't matter if you're in a Quranic country. It doesn't matter if you're in the United States, which is a combination of the two. Evermore. We're becoming socialist in this country. We're becoming evil thinking in this country. Everybody getting into everybody else's business. The government micromanaging our life, even our bedroom. No matter which party you pick, Democratic or Republican, they're all into invading your privacy and controlling your life. So what's the difference between that and Islam and that and communism? Not a whole lot. Difference of degree. Big difference in degree. Okay, but you can still practice righteousness here. In your head. You can obey the laws as bad as they are. Okay, but they can't rule you inside your head. You can take whatever you're supposed to do for the sake of the society you live in, however evil it is, 
and you can still practice righteousness in your head. Because God does say, Romans 13, you should obey the law. Chapters 13 through 15 are a treatise on how do you live in an evil country. Because Rome, at the time Paul was writing, was an evil country. It had a lot of freedom in it, but it was still evil in its basic essence and, and thought pattern. And Paul's saying, hi, you obey your leaders, you obey the law. And then he goes on to show you how that doesn't defeat you. And that you practice righteousness by practicing grace toward other Christians where they have the right to think about God and the Bible any way they want, and so do you. So you don't lord it over them about how they ought to live their lives. Because to each one, you know, each one of us stands before or falls before his own master, who's God. So anybody can practice Christian any way he wants, right or wrong. Just like the government can be any way it wants, right or wrong. Okay, but that doesn't touch your soul. Just like Christ said, and he just threw that at me. It's in Matthew somewhere, where they they can control your body but not your soul. Better to be, you know, uh, suffering here than have your body and soul be thrown into hell. The one who can destroy your soul in hell. And unfortunately, Christians don't understand that apolumi there, for the word for destroy, doesn't mean that your soul ends. You can destroy a thing while it still exists by changing its nature. A person can be destroyed in his soul, even here, topside, by living a life of unrighteousness. By going after unrighteousness, by choosing unrighteousness. Okay, but at the same time, and this is the point here, you can be living in an unrighteous society that has unrighteousness as its activity. But in your head, you can still be obeying God. Because if it's the law of the land, well, then that's what you obey. God could obey Satan and still be righteous. It does not compromise God's righteousness if Satan wins. That's the point. And even deeper than that, God could still be practicing righteousness even if Satan wins. Because Satan can't destroy God. See the point? The only one who can destroy you is you. You're cognitively invincible, but you just don't know how to use that fact because you need to learn more Bible. Okay, fine. What was your Bible class today? Talk to God about it. What did I learn in Bible today, Dad? How do I use this? How do I practice righteousness, Dad? Moment two. How do I practice righteousness, Dad? What should I be thinking? What should I be hearing? What what information and recall of Bible do you want me to get? How do I use this email? How do I wash the dishes? What kind of Bible relates to that? So I'm practicing the righteousness of learning God, of knowing Bible better, of having fellowship with God more in whatever I do. Taking a shower or watching the movies, taking out the trash, taking off your shoes, huddling over some test tubes, sorting through your mail, sitting in a boardroom, tapping on a tablet, learning Windows 8, God help you, or going back to your more familiar operating system, whatever that is. God's in all that. Why can't you be on that with him? Okay, well, that's the ultimate practicing of righteousness, isn't it? And isn't it tasty? No, it's not going to feel good to your body. Your body can't appreciate anything. If you stock your body in Tahiti with a mint julep and you're sitting at the beach, the image of that sounds real pleasant and good. But honey, if you had that for more than a day or two or three or four, you get bored. Because your body can't appreciate pleasure. It just can't. That's why we get bored so quickly. 
How many cars can you own? You got a fleet of 16 cars, every single kind of nice car that everybody dreams of in your garage. Okay, fine. You go down the elevator to your garage. You're staring at all these cars. They're all nice and pristine and colored and pretty. <clears throat> and you have 45 mechanics taking care of the cars and you just stand there and look at them. Then you go out in one. Guaranteed, when you go out in whatever the car is of your choice, you're, one of the things that's going to keep hitting you while you drive is what if somebody dings the car? That detracts from your enjoyment. Doesn't detract from God's. We humans are constantly looking at the bad. So it takes away from whatever good pleasure we got. So the more you get, the more money you get, the more pleasure you get, the more famous you get, the more human approbation you get, the more, I don't know, good feeling you get, you start looking for the other shoe to drop. And that takes away from your happiness. It can actually make you paranoid. It's one of the things I've noticed with rich people. It depends on the person. But a lot of times, the wealth that people work so hard to get, they finally get it. They got $4 million, $10 million, a $1 billion. They're not happy. All they keep looking for is the things that go wrong. And then the money itself is a pain in the neck. Because you got so much of it, what do I do with it? Okay, well, you got that same problem right now. Here you got all this knowledge of God that you have, however much it is. What do you do with it? Don't you feel funny about that? See, that's the human nature. It can't cope with prosperity and it can't cope with adversity. And God's solution to absolutely everything, and he's God, he's got it all. Practice righteousness. Okay, but how, Dad? Well, ask. And one dot at a time, one moment at a time, you get a little more of the answer and you also feel funny the whole time too. But you're doing it. Okay, so you're doing it. Can anything defeat you? And the answer is no. Just like John was saying in 1 John. You've already won. You just don't know it yet. That's the difference. So just keep practicing righteousness. Here's my Bible that I know, Dad. What do I do with that? How does the Bible apply to this and that and the other? And your body is going to treat all this as a slog. Okay, but honey, that's not what it is. Your body's just too low to appreciate what's happening to you. And after the moment's over and you went for it, even if you failed, you will find a satisfaction because you tried. And that same satisfaction is what Christ had on the cross. Yire, yizba, betato yatzdik, tzadik avdila rabim. And what that means is, that's Isaiah 53, 11. And what it means is, he sees, he's satisfied. Through his knowledge, he makes righteous the people. And that's exactly what's happening to you. And you don't necessarily appreciate it during the moment, but you will after. Try it and see. Practice righteousness. Apply Bible to everything. Ask God questions all the time. What should I be doing? What should I be thinking? What am I learning? And then you'll see the kind of thing that is indefeatable, invincible. God's own practicing righteousness, whether you win or lose. And that is true victory.